Welcome to the DaVinci Academy Histology video course. The entire video course is available on YouTube and covers all of the fundamental principles of histology and relevant cell biology. You can find all of the videos from the course by clicking the histology playlist link in the description below, and then you can access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos by going to our website, which is also linked in the description below. All right, so this is the first of two lectures for the integumentary system. In the first lecture, we're going to cover the skin. And so just to give an overview, the integumentary system, it consists of the skin and then its associated appendages, such as the sweat glands, sebaceous glands, mammary glands, hair, and nails. The skin is the largest organ in the body, and as a result of that, it serves multiple functions. So obviously the skin is, you know, our contact point with the outside world for our body. So it's a protective barrier against a lot of physical trauma. So obviously, you know, the skin can get damaged, but it's kind of a first barrier against trauma reaching deeper into the body and damaging any type of underlying organs or tissues. You also have the sun, which obviously sends out UV radiation, and that gets absorbed by the skin. Obviously, too much of that can lead to skin cancer, but it protects UV radiation from diving any deeper and damaging deeper tissues. Oftentimes, the skin is an entry point for infection. So if you have infectious organisms that come in here, such as bacteria or viruses, the immune system often mounts its first round of a defense against infectious organisms within the skin itself, right in here. The skin also contains a lot of blood vessels, and then it also contains sweat glands to help with body temperature regulation. So blood vessels, so blood carries heat and it helps carry heat from the core of the body out into the external portion of the body where the skin is and it allows it to kind of dissipate out of the body. And then, it, so it's a way of getting heat out of the body. And then as the sweat glands, as you know, when you perspire, you know, you have sweat or fluid that builds up on the surface and then it evaporates and then it helps cool the body down as well. Again, since it's interacting with the outside world, it helps us sense the outside world. So we have tactile sensation, thermal sensation, and pain. Also, as a part of this UV radiation, that helps catalyze one of the steps of vitamin D production. So the skin is very important for vitamin D production. And then the skin consists of the following layers, the epidermis and the dermis. We'll go through these in more detail in this lecture. This is a H and E stained slide from the skin. And you can see this layer up here right at the surface. This is your epidermis. It's your epithelial layer essentially. And then all of this, this connective tissue, where all these supporting structures as well are, or this is a hair follicle here, these are glands here, are it's called the dermis. So the epidermis is the most superficial layer of the skin, and it consists primarily of stratified squamous epithelium. And these epithelial cells actually have a special name, they're called keratinocytes. And the epidermis, as you can see here in the slide, actually consists of multiple layers. You can see the multiple layers of epithelial cells, and there's actually, each of these layers has a specialized features and functions to it. And so these multiple layers, they start with the basale, then you have the spinosum, the granulosum, the lucidum, and then the corneum. And it begins with this basale layer, as you can see here, this darker layer here, and then as you move to the more superficial, this kind of stringy, softer looking appearance here. This is the corneum here. This is the final layer. And we'll go through each of these layers over the next few slides. So that first layer, the stratum basale, again, it's a single layer of cuboidal epithelial cells. And you can see that here, they're at the base here in this darker standing line here, essentially. They're more dark, darker standing than the rest of the layers. It's at the base of the epidermal epithelium. So this is the first layer. And it's this layer is actually derived from the ectoderm and embryologically. And so if you think about this layer, we'll draw it like this. You have these cuboidal shaped cells like this. And they have these kind of round or ovoid shaped nuclei like this. And then you have these more squamous layers above it. So this is your basale layer. And as we talked about on the first slide, the skin undergoes a lot of external stress. And so you're constantly turning over these epithelial cells because they get damaged and you know withstand a lot of wear and tear over time. And so you're constantly sloughing off skin cells. Every day you're sloughing off dead skin cells. You gotta replace those. So you have these stem cell layer called the basale here, and they undergo mitosis to produce new keratinocytes. The other thing that they function to do is connect the epidermis 
to the dermis layer. And the way they do that is remember this is an epithelial layer. So with every epithelial layer, you're going to have this basal lamina at the base of it. And then they have these hemidesmosomes, which connect to integrins within the basal lamina to secure that epithelial layer to the dermis. So these lines here would be, you know, those hemidesmosomes and they're connecting to integrins, which are proteins found within the basal lamina to give you a secure connection. Again, the histological appearance, they're going to have large oval nuclei. You can see that here. And then a basophilic cytoplasm. This is just another look at the stratum basale. As you can see, it's, you know, this much darker standing line of cells here. You can really appreciate the cuboidal shape here and then the round ovoid shaped nuclei here and then the darker standing cytoplasm. And then as you can see, it gets lighter and more elongated as you go more superficial towards the corneum layer. The stratum spinosum, as we say here, it's the intermediate layer. So it's just superficial to this basale layer notable for keratinocytes with a spiny appearance. And what that stems from is actually radiating bundles of tonal filaments, which are essentially like intermediate filaments. They're tonal filaments made of cytokeratin that contribute to forming desmosomes, so the junctions between the keratinocytes. So the keratinocytes in this, in this region here, this layer, are kind of histologically appearance-wise defined by these special junctions. And, we'll and there's a really good picture of it on the next slide here. And then there are spaces, as you'll see on the next slide, that are observed often between these cells, and this is due to shrinkage artifact. So you have a lot of interconnections via these tonal filaments forming these desmosomes between cells. The other thing is as cells clo get closer to the surface, they are flatter than they are at the stratum basale. And you can actually really appreciate that here. So here's one that's more that's closer to the surface, a little bit flatter, versus you look at these more closer to the basale layer, they're more roundish. And so this is a really great illustration of this spinosum layer. So you can see these kind of spiny appearance, these little extensions out like this, and then kind of this clear background behind them that that shrinkage artifact. And so, you know, these spiny appearances, again, are those tonal filaments contributing to those junctions, those desmosomes between the keratinocytes. And then again, you can really appreciate here, as you can see, here's the basale layer, and it's much darker staining than this spinosum layer here. And you can see that here again, as you look over here. So the stratum granulosum layer, this is the most superficial of the non-keratinized layers of the epidermis. And the keratinized layers would be obviously the corneum layers. And it's composed of keratinocytes that produce the stratum corneum layer, so this last layer here. And what's notable about the cells in this layer is that they have these basophilic inclusion bodies that contain keratohyaline granules. And these granules are composed of these protein precursors that are rich in histidine and cysteine. And they're precursors for this protein known as filigrin. So filigrin is important because what filigrin done, does, it's going to help form the stratum corneum layer by stimulating keratin filament aggregation within cells. of the stratum corneum layer. And that's kind of the hallmark, as we'll talk about in a second, about the stratum corneum layer, is that these a, it's these anucleate keratinocytes that are richly packed with these aggregated keratin filaments, and that's facilitated by proteins such as filigrin. The way they produce the corneum layer is that the stratum granulosum layer keratinocytes, they undergo modified apoptosis that results in nuclear degradation, but it actually maintains the cell structure. So, you know, during apoptosis, obviously you're gonna have breakdown of the nucleus, and then you have breakdown of the cell, but in this modified apoptosis, you still maintain the general structure of the cell, and you can see that here. So here's this corneum layer here. So you don't have any nuclei, but you still have general cellular structure and cellular shape. A layer that's between the granulosum and the corneum is called the stratum lucidum. This is only in certain parts of the body, and it's known for having a thick stratum corneum layer composed of anucleate keratinocytes. It's only found in areas of the body with thicker skin, such as the palms and the soles of the feet. This layer is going to appear translucent and homogeneous due to the intracellular aggregation of keratin. The corneum layer is the most superficial layer. It's the keratinized layer. When we talk about stratified squamous keratinized epithelium or cornified epithelium, it's because of this layer. It's composed of, as we said, a nucleate or cornified keratinocytes that are filled with keratin filaments and lamellar bodies. This layer is also coated with a glycolipids, and this serves to create 
a water barrier feature of the skin. And the way it does that is remember lipids are hydrophobic. And so that's what helps essentially quote unquote waterproof the skin. One thing that you need to know for histology exams is being able to differentiate thick skin from thin skin. Thick skin, as we'll show on the next slide, has a thicker, more dense stratum corneum, and then thin skin has a thinner, more soft stratum corneum. So you can see this is more thin skin, not as densely packed, it's much softer looking, versus here, this is thick skin. And you can see this corneum layer is much more densely packed together and much thicker. So now that we've gone through the layers of the epidermis, now we'll go through the cells of the epidermis which are mainly the keratinocytes, melanocytes, and Langerhans cells. So first, keratinocytes, we've gone through these already in a lot of detail when we talked about the different layers. We just wanna really elaborate on some processes that we've mentioned as we went through the layers of the epidermis just so to complete the understanding of them. So again, these are the epithelial cells of the epidermis, and they produce keratin filaments that form bundles called tonal filaments that contribute to desmosomes linking adjacent keratinocytes. So just to kind of illustrate this, we'll draw a keratinocyte here like this. And so what they do is they produce these keratin filaments. And this is more in the basal layer here. And then as the cells ascend through, what happens is, is then these keratin filaments aggregate. So here you just have kind of loose keratin filaments. And then you have aggregation here. of keratin filaments. And so then they aggregate together, and then these form what's called tonofilaments, which are essentially intermediate filaments of the cytoskeleton. So they contribute to the cytoskeleton and the ultrastructure of the cell. And then what they also do is they contribute to desmosomes that are linking adjacent keratinocytes like this. So they help not only with the structure of the cell itself, but also with linking cells together to form a strong epidermal layer. The other thing I want to point out here is that, as we kind of touched on, keratinocytes, when, you know, they start in this basale layer with the stem cells, and then they essentially, through their lifespan, ascend through the layers of the epidermis until they reach this cornified layer up here. And that's a process they undergo called keratinization, where they transform these granular cells into cornified cells, into the stratum corneum layer. This involves, as we've mentioned here, increased aggregation of keratin. Remember, there's a protein called filigrin that contributes to that aggregation. As they aggregate into these keratin filaments, they form what's called soft keratin. And that's in comparison to hard keratin, which is found in nails and hair, as we'll talk about in the next lecture. The other thing is that the stratum spinosum layer produces lamellar bodies, as we mentioned. This is actually very unique to keratinocytes. These bodies are essentially granules that contain a mixture of lipids that are responsible for coating the epidermis to essentially form that epidermal water barrier, essentially waterproofing the skin. And because remember, that's because lipids are hydrophobic, and so they help keep water out. So melanocytes, these are cells that are responsible for producing melanin, as it's in the name. Embryologically, they're derived from the neural crest. And then location-wise, they're found between keratinocytes in the layers of the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum, and then also within hair follicles because melanin contributes to skin color, but it also contributes to hair color as well. Melanocytes, as you can see here, they will, if they're in the basal portion here, they can form attachments to the basal lamina, and this can be via hemidesmosomes. However, they do not form junctions with keratinocytes, so no desmosomes between melanocytes and keratinocytes. The histological appearance, as you can see here, they have a large ovoid nuclei, and then they have pale staining cytoplasm surrounding it. From a functional standpoint, they produce melanin via a series of oxidation reactions, first oxidizing tyrosine to 3, 4, dihydroxyphenylalanine or DOPA, and then oxidizing DOPA to melanin. The main function of melanin is actually to protect against damage from UV light, in addition to contributing to skin and hair color. The melanocyte itself, the cell, it actually has multiple cytoplasmic extensions into the stratum spinosum layer. And so if we draw a melanocyte down here, and you know, it has like a extension like this, and then an extension like that, and then an extension out like this. And this is just kind of a very crude, rough drawing. And so what this helps is it actually, these interdigitate with 
carotenocytes. And this facilitates the transfer of filamentous melanin contained in these granules called melanosomes from melanocytes into keratinocytes. So you'll have synthesis of melanin, which are these bands here, these proteins here. So you have actual melanin here, or melanin filaments. And then you have these granules that contain the melanin filaments, and these are called melanosomes. And then what happens is these migrate actually to the ends of these dendritic processes, so essentially like the fingertips here. And then this is where you have transfer of melanin into keratinocytes. And so what happens is this occurs via cytokrine secretion, where essentially you have phagocytosis of these melanosomes by the keratinocyte, but they actually essentially kind of bite off, because remember phagocytosis is essentially cell eating, and so it actually engulfs this entire tip, so this actually part of this cytoplasm here, there's this part of the membrane here, and the cytoplasm surrounding it, and it takes in this entire tip of this dendritic process along with the melanosome to bring it into the keratinocyte. Now, as far as skin color goes, whether someone's a darker skin individual or a lighter skin individual, the number of melanocyte cells is equal among all races. What differs, though, is that it's influenced by a number of different factors. It's multifactorial. So number one is the level of aggregation of melanosomes. So a darker skin individual is going to have more melanosomes, higher concentration within the keratinocytes. A darker individual would also have a higher rate of melanin production. So on this end, you have a higher rate of production. They could also have a higher rate of transfer of melanosomes. And then in lighter skin individuals, they actually have a higher rate of lysosomal degradation. So eventually these get degraded, these melanosomes and these melanin filaments, they get de degraded into this. And so this rate of degradation, because if there's no more melanin around or less melanin around, it doesn't produce as much pigment and their color can't be as dark. So in lighter skin individuals, this rate is actually increased. In darker skin individuals, it's the opposite. It's, it's a slower rate. So Langerhan cells, these are a special type of dendritic macrophages that are found in the skin specifically. And just like other macrophages, they act as antigen presenting cells or APCs. Just to review, we talked about these in previous lectures. They utilize major histocompatibility complex, MHC2, to present foreign antigens to T cells. So essentially they'll interact with a foreign pathogen They'll undergo phagocytosis, break those pro foreign proteins down into foreign antigens, which then they'll display via their MHC2. And so you'll have your foreign antigen like this, which can then interact with T cells. These Langerhans cells, after they interact with foreign pathogens, they're able to travel two lymph nodes via dermal lymphatic vessels, so they can carry it to mount a larger immune response, essentially reinforcements from the immune system. Location-wise, they're usually found in the stratum spinosum layer of the epidermis, and then histologically, they appear similar to other macrophages. They have dense basophilic indented nuclei, so kind of that kidney shape like this. This kind of with that indent like that, and then they have a pale surrounding cytoplasm. On electron microscopy, specifically two Langerhans cells, they have paddle-shaped intracellular granules that are known as Bierbach bodies, and the function of these are unknown. It's just something unique you see on electron microscopy. And then Merkel cells, we'll talk about these again in the next lecture when we talk about skin appendages, glands, and receptors. So these are cells within the stratum basale layer, and they function as mechanoreceptors, so they sense you know, physical touch and they're associated with unmyelinated nerve endings to provide touch sensation. They do form attachments with adjacent keratinocytes via desmosomes, and then histologically they have an indented nucleus, a pale cytoplasm, and then electron-dense perinuclear vesicles. So we'll round out this lecture by talking about the dermis. So the dermis is the layer of skin just deep to the epidermis, and it has two layers itself, the papillary dermis and the reticular dermis. The papillary dermis is, as we say here, the superficial kind of 1 to 20% just below the epidermis. So here's the 
epidermis here, and then here's that basale layer here, kind of darkly stained. Then just deep to that would be the papillary dermis. We'll show you a better picture of this when we show you the epidermal dermal junction. But this is where you have loose connective tissue. And then deep, you can see it really well here, staining bright red, is the reticular dermis, which is dense, irregular connective tissue. A very dense, fibrous network of collagen type 1 and type 3 fibers and then elastic fibers, so a lot of protein, a lot of collagen fibers in here, densing nice bright red here, eosinophilic for you. This is also the layer that's going to contain the blood vessels for the skin, sweat glands, nerves, sensory receptors. It's also the site of where the immune response occurs, both to you know infections, skin wounds, cutaneous allergic reactions. The hypodermis is not technically a layer of the skin, but it's a, it's a region that's just deep to the dermis in some areas, and it's, it's composed of loose connective tissue and adipocytes. It provides cushioning and insulation. You can see this here. So here you see these pockets of adipocytes here and here. Sometimes hair follicles and sweat glands can extend into the hypodermis, and then it also sometimes contains smooth muscle cells. The epidermal dermal junction, so this is a great picture of it here. This is from thick skin. And you can see this very thick, densely packed stratum corneum here. So you have the dermal papillae, which are these, as you can see, kind of lightly stained here, these finger-like projections. And then in between them, interdigitating, so you have, you know, papillae like this. And then on the other side, on the epidermis, you have the epidermal ridges. And that would be these dark staining finger-like projections from the epidermis, as you can see here. What this does is it increases the contact surface area between the two layers, and that helps with, you know, withstanding significant shearing forces. So you'll see this most prominently in areas like the fingertips, the palms, and the soles. And interesting enough, the different pattern, the way these are arranged differently in each individual, actually serves as the microanatomical basis for a person's fingerprints and footprints. And then, as we mentioned earlier, if you'll notice these dermal papillae, it's more of a loose connective tissue, as you can see here. It's much more loosely arranged than that kind of dense, coarse collagen fibers you see in the reticular dermis. And just to close out this lecture, we have kind of a side-by-side -side here, a thick skin versus thin skin, just so you can have these differences down, because this will definitely show up on a lab practical. So obviously, the big differences is the stratum corneum layer. So if you look at here for thick skin, much thicker, much denser than is for here in the thin skin. This is more thin and wispy versus this is more dense and compact. The big thing is location wise is you're only gonna see thick skin in a couple places, the palms of the hand and then the soles of the feet. Everywhere else is pretty much thin skin. The other thing with thick skin is you're gonna see no hair. So you won't see any hair follicles. So if you pick up a slide or you have a slide on your computer and you're scrolling through it on the virtual microscope and you see a hair follicle, it's not thick skin. Right there, right away, you know, you know that it's not. You can check the corneum just to double check, but more, more likely than not, it is not from the thick skin. The other thing you'll notice is that notice how these epidermal ridges and these dermal papillae are very long, very deep here. And so you can see that's to increase the surface area, and that makes sense functionally because these areas of the skin are gonna to have to withstand significant shearing forces. And so that makes sense in these areas. You're gonna have more support here structurally. Versus if you look over here in the thin skin, sometimes there's not even significant dermal papillae and epidermal ridges like you see in this slide, or sometimes you'll see them and they're very short. They're much shorter than this is what is seen here. The other thing in thin skin is sometimes the granulosum layer is much thinner or not even or even hard to observe versus in the thick skin it's much more prominent and it's much easier to see because it it's just it makes sense it's it's responsible for producing much more or a much thicker stratum corneum layer. Thank you for watching this video from the Da Vinci Academy Histology video course which is completely available on YouTube. To access the corresponding practice questions and histology lab videos go to our website using the link in the description below.